Sherry. And good morning, everyone. Good morning. Very good. Very good. They're, they're awake. They're awake. Hallelujah. So don't put them to sleep. <laughs> no. Okay. Welcome to Grace Community Church and happy Independence Day. We're so glad that you're able to worship with us this morning and be here. And we're especially delighted for those who are joining us online this morning. And we thank you for them. If you're new to Grace Community Church, we hope you will be that you will <clears throat> on your way out, pick up one of our gift bags as you leave this morning. And also, you could fill out one of these from your bulletin and drop it in the offering baskets as you leave. We would appreciate that. And also, we have a scripture memory and prayer card that relates to this morning's message. You can use this on a, a, a regular basis, a weekly basis. It's very good. So that's in your bulletin as well. <clears throat> Men, tomorrow, 8 a.m., Trivoli Gardens. And women... What? I said glory. <laughs> you need to be there. Jim, are you going to be there? Yeah. All right. And if anybody knows where the where you put the batteries in him, let me know, would you? <laughs> and women, tomorrow morning, 930, the ladies' Bible study on the attributes of God. And I heard that's been very, very good. So remember that tomorrow morning. You may have noticed the setup this morning looks a little different than normal. No, it's not for bingo. You may have been thinking that, but it's not. We are going to have a 4th of July celebration luncheon immediately following the service, and those are for you. And everybody can come too, Doug. And everybody can come too, Doug. Yeah, that's right. So there you go. Even if they didn't sign up ahead of time. Even if you didn't sign up ahead of time. Am I interrupting you? No, you're a real good straight man. <laughs> straight man. And also, um, the offices will be closed tomorrow due to the holiday, and Pastor Cliff's Romans Bible study is on pause for the time being. It will resume toward the end of the summer. So, let's stand, if you would, for our call to worship. I need a microphone. You are the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. At the beginning of the time, laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They shall perish, but you shall endure. All things shall fade as the rose of the articles of clothing. You shall treat them as a change of garments, and they shall be discarded. But you, but you are, are the same. same. And your years shall never end. And you can remain standing. Together as we sing our opening songs of praise.
forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his inheritance. Psalm 125 tells us, As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth and even forever. We serve a God who is with us, 
as Presbyterians, we believe that God is present even in the elements of Holy Communion. Christ is present spiritually. Let us pray to our God who is right here with us. Most holy and mighty God, we are happy to be your people who stand in awe of your mercy. You have provided salvation, guidance, protection, and your very presence to us. We are grateful for your church, where we grow in your presence. We are grateful for this great nation, which you have prospered. We thank you for our rights and privileges. We thank you for our form of government and protections. We thank you for our natural resources and our freedom. Protect us, for we recognize your dominion and lordship. We pray for our leaders, guide them. We pray for our military, protect them. We pray for civil servants, grant them wisdom and servants' hearts. We pray for all of this congregation who are in need of your healing or your comfort or your guidance. Bless us so that we may live lives worthy of the term Christian. Help us also to be a Christian nation under God with liberty and justice for all. We pray in our Lord's name now the prayer he taught us singing together. for today come from both the 102nd Psalm and then from the letter of James. In the beginning, you, God, laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them, and they will be discarded. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. The children of your servants will live in your presence. Their descendants will be established before you. And from James, the first chapter, 16, verse 16 through 18. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly height, lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, bud. It's great to see you all this morning in patriotic colors, especially Gary in your patriotic green. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're, we're a, 
I, I've got this new earpiece, so I don't fiddle with it so much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think we're a little on the loud side there. Uh, at least I'm getting a little feedback. Scott, is that right? New guy in the back. Fantastic. I, it is so good to be with you uh, this morning. And I want to encourage you afterwards that when we sit at the tables, by the way, again, you didn't have to sign up for this. We prepared. We've got 180 chickens in the back waiting for you. Okay, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but um, you, you know, please let's make sure we have a minimum of five people at each table because we don't want people left out like poor Merv at the back of the sanctuary. You know, I just worry about him. Um, I want to thank you all. Uh, this last, the last five weeks have been pretty challenging for my family. Uh, most of you know that my dad died five weeks ago and that my wife's father died Wednesday while he was here. He was visiting with us and um, uh, fractured his hip in Tucson. We transferred him up here, uh, had seizures uh, last week, and then we took him to the emergency room, and uh, he was there a couple of days, and he was just gone. But uh, I think it was a beautiful thing that he could be with his daughter these last several weeks. And... Uh, Jane uh, is not with us here. She is back in the Sunday school room over there. You'll see her out for chicken though afterwards. By the way, if you uh, would like to be a helper with the Sunday school just once a month, uh, would you see me? Uh, you don't have to plan lessons and all that. Just help, okay? Just be there. And uh, it's a fun time. Well, I don't know about you, but from the days. Uh, that I first remember celebrating the 4th of July. Uh, times in our country have changed quite a bit. Uh, I don't know if uh, you've sensed that. I, I just looking at things, I, well, consider this. You all remember when milk was delivered to your house? And how many of you remember that? Anybody have a horse-drawn cart or, a, or wagon bring it to your house? A few of you. Yeah, that's unbelievable. And, and not so much anymore. Milkmen have been done out of business. They, 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 there are no delivery guys out there, or very few, unless you get schwans or something like that. But uh, you remember, remember dial phones? You'd wear out your finger if you had a lot of phone calls to make. You know, dial phones, if you were cool, you'd put a little pen thing in there and dial it, or, or you'd landlines. Some of us still have landlines. How many people have landlines here? Oh, yeah, you know what generation we're from. Oh, goodness. Anybody still have a tape recorder around their house? Tape recorders, yeah. Answering machine, faxes, videotapes, CD players, dictionaries, libraries, real paper books. I love them, so give them to me if you want a final resting place for them. I'm, I'm a bibli idolater, but they're not so much anymore. People look at these things as largely the thing in the past. You can't give fax machines away. You just can't do it. In just a few short years, we have gone to these marvelous little things that we look into. I mean, cell phones, you don't just talk on them. You look at your latest TV show, sports, everything. You can get 550 million different channels on them. Or if that's too small for you, then you get your big honking smart TV, which isn't some measly 26-incher like we used to think was really great. I mean, these are all, it's all so different. We have vast amounts of, of information at our fingertips. I mean, you can, I mean, when you can watch a basketball game on your phone, you know we have come a long way, baby. And, and you don't have to worry about party lines. Remember party, anybody remember party lines? Oh, yeah, you get on there and, you know, you know, good old Mabel next door would be listening in going, oh, what's this conversation all about? Oh, so you've got a, a girlfriend now. Woo you know, get off the phone. You don't have that. You just have the government listening in. It's a <laughs> times have changed. We don't say, I mean, now this group, you all have been very kind. You've sent me lots of cards. I know you still know what a card is. You know how to address an envelope and how to put a stamp on it and return address. You know all that stuff. But nowadays, it's like, why would you do that, Dad? <laughs> Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, email, parlor. You know, not snail mail, Dad. They'll never get there. 
And, and of course, the United States Post Office lives down to expectations. Sorry, Gerald, no offense, man. It's not like it used to be when you were in charge. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just different. We used to have three channels plus UHS. Remember that? ABC, NBC, CBS, what are those? You know, it, 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 it's so different. Does anybody actually wait until the evening edition of the newspaper comes to hit your doorstep? You've been waiting a long time, haven't you? <laughs> what about the 6 o'clock news? You, you don't need to wait until 6 o'clock to get the news. It's 24-7, baby. It's amazing. Remember when we used to get dressed up to go to work? Suit, tie. Now it's like, go to work? I just opened my laptop here at home. I stay in my PJs all day. Oh, wow. I mean, you don't have to go to a dance or a party to meet somebody to date anymore. Online dating is as common as drinking water. If you want a chance at, at, at becoming a celebrity, you go to YouTube and you, you do it for free, whatever. Uh, and if you're discovered, hallelujah. But huh. remember when it was a big deal to fly? Remember that? You'd actually dress up to go on an airplane. If you were a part of the jet setters, you were really, really cool Airports are kind of almost like glorified bus stations these days. I mean, most people don't even remember in-flight meals, let alone w when we didn't have to remove our shoes to get on a plane. <sighs> remember when it was special to go out shopping? Especially Christmas shopping, and you'd build your day around the lunch hour and going out, and you'd, oh, there'd be all the festivities and stuff. Now you just go to Amazon, punch it in, boom, 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 done. Got the grandkids, the great grandkids, the great great grandkids. I know there are some more a little older than you think here, but you know, the, 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 you, you get it all done. They'll even wrap it up, send it for you. You don't have to go to the Sorry, you're all, yeah, the post office and wait in a long line. It's just done. There's not much to it. Most people don't smoke tobacco anymore, but it's okay to smoke weed. Uh, and, and, and you can do that unfiltered, and people aren't going to squawk about it. Remember, remember you, when people would insult people say, by saying, your mama wears army boots, or your mama's got tattoos. And now people say, why, thank you. We used to differentiate ourselves between men and, and, and women. And now we're so sexually confused, we could be anything, LGBTQ, Q, 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 Q. I mean, Cuomo's daughter just said she's a demisexual. I don't know what that is. I, I'm clueless. People used to get married, and, and if they had, many of them had big families. Now young women, what do they want? They want a career, a dog, and maybe a boyfriend, maybe. Marriage, what's that? Kids are a hassle. And guys, this is one I really don't get. I mean, in sports, guys can say they're a woman and compete against girls. Women, sorry. I can't say that anymore. What, what's up with that? And they can, they can declare themselves a woman. And they can say they're pregnant when, well, uh, anyway, times have changed. More and more robots deliver pizza, drones fight our battles, and cars drive us. We're changing faster and faster. Our population's fatter, worships less, is massively addicted more. We live longer but commit suicide more frequently. We're getting older. Our bones are brittle and our memories are less focused. Children in our education system can't pray in school like we used to. Rarely do we say the Pledge of Allegiance in class. Typically, uh, we're not required anymore to take civic classes if we're as young as I am, like high school. i um, kidding. Um, kids now going to school live in fear, uh, not of being picked on by a bully, but of being shot at by a mass shooter. Any idea of letting your kids go and wander the streets on a bicycle? Would you let your kid go to town? I, mean, I know some of you have little kids run. No, okay, a few. Uh, you, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't just let your kid ride your, their bike wherever. Nationally, our corporations support by the billions Black Lives Matter without even caring that they don't really have anything to do with race. They have everything to do with Marxism 
and destroying America as we know it. Critical race theory now teaches that we can fight racism with racism. Oh boy, now that's real smart. You better study that. If you don't, aren't up on these issues, you'll fall for anything. I mean, really, what they are doing today is staggering. We seem to have forgotten when it comes to race what Martin Luther said in his powerful dream, I look to a day when people will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Used to be a point of pride to be an American. Now you've got to have pride in the month of June. And last time I checked, that kind of pride was a sin. We used to be proud of our flag. Many of our politicians and high-tech CEOs openly reject God, embrace secularism, desecrate our flag, want to pack the Supreme Court, ignore our Constitution, harvest ballots, abort our children, cancel those who disagree with them, tear down our borders, defund our police, and allow Antifa terrorists to burn down our cities. They celebrate wrong as right and right as wrong, and then when things go south for them, they blame the other party. We're a long way from the God and country spirit of the 1950s. As one of my pastor friends puts it, the milk of human kindness is rapidly evaporating. The words Jesus spoke about when it comes to the end times appear to be coming true. Matthew 24, 10 through 12 reads this way. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Hope and change? Pfft. A lovely campaign slogan. But not all change is good, friends. Even so, good or bad, as Bobby Dylan once crooned, the times they are a changing. Times change, things change, we change. Experts tell us the most successful people are the ones who learn to cope with change. But I am more and more convinced that the best way to cope with change, ironically enough, is to get to know the God of the Bible who does not change like shifting sands or shadows or shifting anything. He's the one who is the anchor to us in the swirling seas of instability. Now, I'll admit, when I was growing up, I remember seeing a scripture verse from Malachi written in the stained glass at the front of the sanctuary. And it said this, For I am the Lord, I do not change. And I remember thinking to myself, That statement, it's, it's so obvious and it's so irrelevant to who I am. I mean, really, what's the point of that? You got that right, God. You don't change. Church doesn't change. Choir doesn't change. So what? Big deal. What's that got to do with me? One of my problems was that I had a completely wrong understanding of what is called immutability. You don't mutate, you don't change, you don't whatever. It's the unchangingness of God. I didn't get that. I didn't understand it. I assumed it meant that God was frozen and static and unwilling to budge. He was like a rock. And in some ways, that's true, but everything around him changed. I get that, but he never changed, and maybe that's because he was becoming less relevant. But then I came across this passage in Scripture that obliterated my understanding of the immutability of God. I don't know if you remember Genesis 18, where Abraham has this fascinating face-to-face -face discussion with God. Taking Abraham into his confidence, God's uh, reveals this plan that he's going to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. And when Abraham learns that the Lord intends to destroy his nephew's adopted hometown if a certain number of righteous people can't be found, Abraham gets a little nervous. 
Abraham had done business in Sodom. He'd walked the streets of Gomorrah. He knew if their, if their future depended on righteousness, their lease on life was about to expire. In a desperate attempt to hold back the inevitable, Abraham starts this conversation with God. Well, God, um, you wouldn't destroy the righteous with the wicked, would you? What if there are 50 righteous people living in those towns? You wouldn't display your wrath on 50 righteous people, would you? And God kind of considers what he's saying. He says, no, Abraham, if, if there are 50 righteous people in Sodom, I'll spare the city for their sake. And then Abraham starts counting out the righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. One, two, three. Three people. Ooh, I'm still 47 away. There's got to be another one. There's got to be more. And then Abraham goes on to say, and he, Lord, just, just bargain with me a little bit here. Will you kind of loosen up a little bit? Uh, look, what if we just had 45 people or, or 40 people or 30 people or 20 people or 10 people? Would you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah then? We know the answer. I was blown away the first time that I realized the full implication of this conversation. Does this mean that we have a God who changes plans? Do we serve a God who will react and respond to human requests? Well, maybe I don't really get the nature of this immutability business. I found that the immutability of God, whatever it means, doesn't rule out a God who is responsive and who is willing to react to our problems and requests. We're, we're not merely living in some sort of a deterministic world. We have a God who moves and acts and reacts, yet at the same time we have a God who is absolutely 100% consistent in his character. Amen? I knew I'd get something out of you. If you're going to get fried chicken, you're going to have to do a whole lot better than that. The fact that God is absolutely consistent in his character is actually really good news, but only because of the quality of his character. Sometimes consistency can be bad. I know a lot of people who are dishonest, slothful, deceitful people, and that's a huge problem. They're very consistent in all of that. But when we're talking about God, his power, his presence, his knowledge, his commitments, his graciousness, his generosity, and all the rest, it becomes really clear that any change in God's character would have to be for the worse. If God changed, that would mean he'd have to be a whole lot less gracious. He'd have to be a whole lot less faithful. He'd, he'd speak to me less and guide me less, and I don't want that, do you? Really? Think about it. I may want my spouse to change. I may want my spouse to change. I may want my children to change. I may want my friends in church to change. But I, I, oh, and I want myself to change too. Yeah. But I don't want God to change. Think about it. Any product can be improved. You can create laundry detergent to make clothes whiter and, and better for the environment. And you can improve your breakfast cereal by adding vitamins or fiber or crunch. But how in the world can you improve on the omniscience, omnipotence, and perfect righteousness of, of God? The only way God can change is to somehow be less than he is. The Bible in James 1.17 is very adamant that God changing is never going to happen. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Notice. Not only is there no turning, there is no shadow of turning. God doesn't even begin to lean away from righteousness, much less move his feet 
He is consistent in a world where everything changes, and it seems to be changing exponentially faster and faster, and in a world which usually decays. God stands firm in every aspect of his character. This is right where immutability begins to touch our lives in a very powerful way. In spite of centuries of Christian experience faithfully passed on through the ages, I still, I still have some moments where I kind of have some doubts about God. Yeah, I sometimes wonder, you know, as pressures build, I, does God really know about this? He may be omniscient, but somehow this escaped his attention. Or maybe we're involved in some tricky situation and disaster seems certain and God seems distant and we may, we say in fear, well, I don't think he's present with me right now. This may be the first time he's taken a 15 minute break and it's finally happened and it's happened on my, with me. Or maybe we get ourselves buried into some addiction or entangled in some sort of destructive relationship where we see someone we love trapped in a seemingly insurmountable adverse circumstance and we quietly groan, oh, God may be powerful. He may be all powerful. But I don't think he even has the power to solve this one. Ooh, we're right on the edge there, friends. Maybe we say to ourselves, the God of Moses who parted the waters, the God of David who slew Goliath, that was God in his prime. But somehow over the years, the centuries have taken his toll on the old duffer. Some of us fear that God's lost his stuff. His fastball doesn't pop like it used to. His curveball hangs. His breaking ball doesn't break anymore. And those of us out in the field are feeling pretty powerless to dodge all the balls that are being hit our, in our direction. To which God would cry out through the prophet Malachi, For I am the Lord. I do not change. God's been omniscient from eternity past and will be in eternity future. God will always know everything about you, even Gary. Okay? He will know everything about you. He will always be present every time you step on a plane. You, you can rest assured that God is on that plane with you. He isn't staying home for, for, for you know, just taking a day off, kicking his feet back. He isn't taking, taking time off. He hasn't lost his stuff. Everything that God was, God is, and we can benefit immeasurably from this precious truth. We can. The same God who empowered Samson, Gideon, and Paul seeks to empower your life and my life because God hasn't changed. And this is great news for people who are committed, but it's sobering news for the complacent. Think about it. While committed believers may find comfort in God's unchanging nature, others are maybe fervently hoping that God's mellowed out over the years. Um, I don't know, maybe you think that. That although the, in the, the Old Testament, God showed this uh, mean streak, he's softened somewhat in the New Testament, and now 2,000 years later, he just kind of looks down and he smiles and he says, oh, well, boys will be boys and girls will be girls, and you all were basically pretty good this last year. Well, let me be straight with you. God doesn't hate sin any less passionately than he hated it 10,000 years ago. You won't be judged any differently than Adam and Eve because God doesn't hold to different standards. He does not. His standard has been and always will be perfection. One sin and you're accountable for it. That's the deal. So don't think that you can slide by a God who's a little less vigilant these days, get a little fuzzy between the ears. That's not going to happen. If you've committed that one sin and haven't crawled into the spiritual protection program of Jesus Christ, you have exposed yourself in a way that you do not want to be exposed. Now, Phoenix... 
I've noticed, like many cities, has these HOV lanes. Have you noticed that? You can go in these lanes if it's off hours, even you're just alone in the car, no big deal. Uh, you know, but, but it's a high occupancy vehicle lane. And so if you have, I guess, high occupancy means you got to have two or more live people there. I was looking at some report some time ago where somebody had a skeleton in his car and <laughs> you're like, no, skeletons don't work. Dolls don't work. No, no, no. But if you get busted driving in the HOV lane on your own or with a skeleton or a doll or something like that, you're going to get, you're going to be fined 400 clams. Whew. If it's a bad accident, if there's a bad accident though, if it's a legal holiday, the restriction on those carpool lanes may change and, and, and anyone can use them. At other times, drivers kind of just simply take a chance. They, they dart in and out of the restricted lanes, hoping that no police car will show up in their rearview mirror, not so with God or my son who's studying law enforcement. God's restrictions are never lifted. He doesn't change his rules according to the calendar or any particular generation. He doesn't make exceptions for particular challenges. God isn't going to say, well, that's okay that you just spewed your anger all over your entire family and you broke all those relationships. Oh, oh, you've had a rough day at work? Okay, I understand, but you didn't have the right to, to say this or that or do this or that. This time, your sin, we're going to just, okay, we're going to just let all those sins go. We'll just... I can't, na 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 na. I can't hear it. I, we commit a sin. God knows it. But I will tell you that there's this beautiful offering of grace and love and security and blessing through Jesus Christ. When our son Sam was about five years old, I don't remember what he did, but man, he was bawling because he was in trouble. And he just looked at me and, <laughs> Dad, uh, uh, you're, you're not going to love me anymore. And I thought about it for a second. No, I didn't have to think about it for a second. But, you know, when kids are that age, you're just going, oh, crud, I don't know what you just did. But boy, you know, ah, oh, you're breaking my heart. So I took Sam into my arms and I, Talked to him about what happened, and, and then I said something uh, to the effect of, of, oh, son, there is nothing that could ever stop me from loving you. Ever, Dad? Ever, Sam. And I remember praying a kind of a prayer where I just said, oh, Lord, help my son to never waste one moment Wondering whether or not I will stop loving him. I don't know about you, but I've wasted some hours in my life wondering and worrying about w whether God would remove his grace, would remove his blessing from me. Malachi 3.6, James 1.17, they promise me that I will not be the first person that God... Uh, that, that, that fails God. Let me flip that around. I will not be the person, first person God fails. How's that? God will never fail me. God will never fail you. That person doesn't exist. And it's nothing but a colossal waste of time for us to be sitting around worrying about it. This unchanging security provides us with this solid rock in a world filled with insecurity. I don't know how many of you have uh, still got, I don't know, Encyclopedia Britannica or World Book Encyclopedia on your shelves. When was the last time you looked at that? How many people still have a, an encyclopedia at home? Raise your hand, admit it. Oh, Gary, are you the only one? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Anyway, everybody else is like, get rid of these things. I don't want to haul these around. Uh, but 
If you look at encyclopedias, I mean, they were big business back in the day. But if you open up any one of them right now and you try to figure out what's going on with astrophysics, there, we've got whole new planets, whole new universes that have been discovered. If you, if you crack one of those babies open and you start looking at scientific explanations of, of uh, I don't know, medicine, how we're going to heal people. Well, goodness gracious, it's changed a lot. I wouldn't want to, to uh, go on some of the same things that we went on 10, 20, 100 years ago. Remember, they used to say, smoking is good for you. Yeah. You know. Oh, not so much. Not so much. So virtually every realm of academia, of science, and knowledge have become as outdated as quickly as they can be written down. But this study of God, this study of the God of the Bible that we've been working on over the last month or so, this is a study for the ages. If, if the English language as we know it is decipherable 2,000 years ago from now, or 2,000 years from now, somebody ought to be able to listen to this sermon and get just as much benefit from the character and unchanging nature of God as the person who hears it in the early years of the 20th, 21st century. I'll get it together one of these days. I'll figure that out. And the reverse is true. What was written for us thousands of years ago is just as true today as it was then. Since we know that, that since we know all about God, since we know all about the God that we're looking for, some, some of us might be asking, uh, well, then what does this God want from me? Okay, we're learning all this stuff, Cliff. This is great. But what's God want from me? Well, the pagan religions, the God of, gods of the ancient pagan world would respond, well, give me your firstborn child. And uh, why don't you burn that child in the fire? Or the gods of other religions might say, well, you've got to make sure you obey every single rule. This and this and this and this. But the God that we have in the Bible says, give me your heart. Hold out your hands. Put on your shoes. Let's walk through life together. Back in the 8th century B.C., Israel began wondering, well, what does God want from us anyway? They started thinking about the several possibilities, and there's no surprise here. They came up with all the wrong answers, because just as we do, every time we look for answers outside of the Bible, we get it wrong. And so into this mass of confusion, God drops this prophet named Micah. And as a part of his teaching, Micah spends some time just echoing all of Israel's misguided speculations. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give him my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? There's a little bit of sarcasm here. It's sort of like somebody saying to, to God, well, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What does God really want here? Does he want a tenner from me? A 20? I'll get a 20? Maybe a 50. No, no, what, that's not enough? I mean, what if I give him Walmart or Amazon or all oh, of Microsoft? Why don't I give him all three? Well, fine. If that's not enough, I guess I'll just give him my firstborn child as well. Maybe then God will be satisfied. Micah concluded that none of these would suffice. The person asking them completely misunderstands the nature and character of God. None of these things could possibly satisfy God's heart. So what in the world does God want? Micah provides a very simple answer that still applies today. Some of you know it. He wants us to walk with him. That's right, just to walk with him. Micah explains, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you. But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. 
one of my jobs in the wake of my father's death was to start going through all the family albums of photographs, and there were a lot of them, and there still are a lot to go through. And I noticed one of the early pictures from my life was of my dad walking with me on the beach. And you know how you walk with a kid on the beach? you got their little arms like this, and dad's oh, kind of wobbling. You can tell I'm pretty wobbly, and dad's walking down the beach with me. Well, it, it so happens that as I turned the pages of those albums, eventually I got to these different places, and I noticed that dad and I often took pictures of us walking together, hiking, backpacking, doing all that kind of stuff, even even to the waning days of his life. We take a walk down the hall with this walker. <laughs> Dad could sometimes challenge me and give me a good swift kick. But most of the time he was he was just encouraging me, enjoying me, spurring me on. When he did give me a good swift kick, it was for my own good. And a walk is what Christ's followers do when we want to be in a loving relationship with God. All of us are going to walk our 18, 36, 80 years, maybe even 100 years on the beach of life. And Whose hand will we hold? Whose hand do you hold? Whose fellowship do you enjoy along the way? The answer to that question will make all the difference. So what does the God of the universe want from us? He's saying right now, Kenny, Andrew, Tim, Ned, let's go for a walk. Here's my hand. Let's do life together. What's it mean to walk with God? It means when I wake up in the morning, I, my first thoughts are, good morning, Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord, that by his blood shed on the cross, I am able to declare to us today, we are forgiven. Amen. We do this in remembrance of Jesus, showing that he was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. For all that he has done, we are bound to give him most hearty thanks, to take up our own crosses and follow him. And as he has given commandment, we are bound to love each other as he has first loved us. For as we are all partakers of this one bread and drink of this one cup, so are we all one body in him. May we pray. <coughs> Lord God, we, we thank you for being here with us. We ask you to set aside now the secular use of these elements of bread and the fruit of the vine, blessing them with your spiritual presence, Jesus, that as we participate and partake of these elements, we may be nourished unto abundant and eternal life. Amen. According to the institution of our Lord, and in memory of him we do this, for on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had blessed it and had given thanks, he broke it, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. The body of Christ given for you. In the same way, after the supper, our Lord took the cup and he said, this is my blood, the cup of the new covenant, poured out for the remission of sins. As often as you drink of this cup, you declare my death until the day of my coming. Drink you all of it. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for this holy supper. It represents to us the price that you paid upon the cross that we might be redeemed and that we might be 
esteemed as your children. Thank you, O Lord, that you lifted us from the miry pit and placed our feet on solid ground. Thank you that you hold us close to your, your heart and that there is nothing that can separate us from your love. Thank you, O God, that the firm foundation of our lives is no longer the nightly news or the daily news. It's no longer things like science that changes all the time and politicians who change all the time. Lord, it is you, the glorious, immutable one who loves us with an everlasting love. And so we give to you all glory, honor, thanksgiving, and praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Let's sing this final song as a prayer. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited to sing that song with you and it's good for us to remember our godly roots in America and uh, I was just I just this has nothing to do with anything but I'm looking forward to next month doing away with these and going back to regular communion amen I I want to remind you that as you join together at tables make sure there's a minimum of five people I mean if you're all alone uh, you get to sit with me, and that's the naughty table. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I, before we pray, and we're going we're gonna to not only uh, give thanks to the Lord, but we'll have our benediction as well. Um, I want to thank uh, Patty and Debbie and others, uh, Ava and others who have been so, who else, who else? And Beth, where are you, Beth? There you are, um, for helping to pull this, this lovely picnic lunch together uh, that we might enjoy the fellowship of the Lord's people. So, Lord, we give you thanks for this, for this Holy Supper that we have just received and for this Holy Supper that we're about to receive. We thank you, Lord, for the hands who have prepared this, for the strength that we will receive from this food and from this fellowship. 
We pray, O Lord, that it would be used to bring glory and honor to your holy name. And now, dear friends, remember the words of Zephaniah 317. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. And now as we prepare to eat, we do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.